Today, I will talk about the phonetic uh, information contained in the Chinese script. So uh, just to start, you know, very simple, right? Uh, we all know about uh, these the, these different, these four words for ma that we use to teach uh, tones. So uh, mother uh, is ma and uh, horse is ma. And uh, mother as a character is made of the uh, uh, two components. So on the left is the uh, part that means woman. And on the right is uh, the part that looks like it means horse, but here it's saying pronounce like ma, right? So this is very simple. And, and then in a way we can say, you know, what's the information encoded in the character? The information is, uh, say the morpheme that sounds like horse and has something to do with a woman, right? And then, uh, you know, in, in my own sort of thinking about the uh, this, you, you have to know it, right? It's, 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 the structure is a kind of aid to memory, uh, but you have to know, oh, the, because I know Chinese already, the word that has something to do with a woman and is pronounced like horse is the word for mother, right? So just to say from now on, so uh, I'm going to use uh, middle Chinese uh, for the pronunciation of Chinese characters, not uh, pinyin because it's a little bit, I don't know, because uh, I'm more familiar with it, frankly, uh, but also it's a, it's further back in time. So middle Chinese is from 602. So it, it, and then, and then the characters of course were invented, uh, you know, I don't know, in the Shang or the Zhou dynasty. So middle Chinese is the earliest point where we have totally systematic information about uh, the pronunciation of Chinese characters. So I'm putting pinyin behind us and we go with middle Chinese from now on. Yeah. So now we look at, um, the series of characters written with the phonetic uh, horse. And the, the question we're exploring is, what information is it that we're being given by the fact that uh, a particular character is written with this phonetic, yeah? So we have this character, yeah? And then this one, and then this one. Oops, just, I think it's just the three of them in this series. So it's quite a small series. And now we ask ourselves, so, so what does this phonetic mean? And uh, we can say for sure that it doesn't tell us anything about tone. The first character is Shang Shang, <laughs> and the second character is Chu Sheng. I think that's right. Uh, and then the third character has both readings, right? So clearly the information, what tone is it, uh, is not indicated by the phonetic. But from this example, it looks like maybe the phonetic is telling us what the initial is and is telling us what the vowel is, yeah, or the rhyme, if you like, yeah. So, uh, ma. Uh, so now this is our initial hypothesis that the phonetic, uh, I mean, I, I'm, this is a conceit, right, for the purpose of, of exposition, right? But our conceit is maybe what a phonetic tells us about uh, the pronunciation of a word is its initial and its uh, nucleus, but not its rhyme, yeah? So now we look at another series, yeah? This one based around uh, bie. So we have bie, we have bie in a different tone. We have pie, we have pie, we have pa, and then we have pa uh, also in different tones, and then pa with the aspirate, and then ba. Okay. So now we look at this and we think, okay, well, our idea that uh, the pronunciation tells us nothing about the tone is confirmed. And our idea that the phonetic tells us the initial is sort of disconfirmed, right? Because here we have, uh, I'll just go through it. We have b and p and ph. So clearly the phonetic is not telling us which one it is, but these all are uh, obstruents with the same place of articulation. So maybe the, 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 the phonetic in the character is saying uh, bilabial stop. Yeah, this, what, whatever character I write with this phonetic starts with a bilabial stop. Maybe that's what it says. And then uh, as for the, it, you know, the, the, the idea that the phonetic specifies the rhyme uh, or, the, or the main vowel, um, we see here, we have two rhymes. We have ah and we have yeah, yeah? So it seems that 
this was also uh, disproved, if you like, this conjecture. But actually, it's not the case, because if we look at the odes, uh, here is ode uh, 18 stanza one uh, on the lamb furs, five many tresses, uh, sorry, many thread tresses of white silk. We see that this bie, which is in, in the Sheshung series we're talking about, so it has the phonetic we're talking about, rhymes with da. So that's because the I'm writing this in Middle Chinese. Yeah, The bie is in Middle Chinese and the da is Middle Chinese. But the poems are written in Old Chinese. So it looks like actually maybe in Old Chinese, these were the same vowel. Yeah. And just to give you another example from the same Sheshung series, this is Ode 145, stanza one. By the shore of that march, there are sedges and lotus plants, uh, where here this pie, it rhymes with ha. So again, uh, we have an, an, another character in the same series written with the same phonetic that, uh, that uh, rhymes with uh, a character that is pronounced in ah. So it looks like ye and ah rhymed in the odes. And then this means that here where it says, you know, two rhymes, ah and yeah, these are actually somehow one rhyme, yeah? Okay. So it was based on evidence of this type uh, that uh, Duan Yutai, uh, who was uh, a great uh, Qing linguist, philologist uh, in the 18th and 19th century, uh, proposed what we call the Sheshang hypothesis. And that is that any two characters written with the same phonetic component uh, write words that would have rhymed in the language of the Shijing. Now, it's it's necessary to praise it this way, would have rhymed, because, of course, many characters, most characters, in fact, are never used as rhyme words in the Shijing. So, it, so it's not a sort of testable, falsifiable hypothesis. It's more like a research program. And, and the way to think of it is, like, you know, we only have 350 um, uh, poems in the Shijing. But if we had an infinite supply, yeah, <laughs> uh, then, you know, it, it, th th that's the sort of thought experiment. If we had an infinite supply, eventually we would find the character we're interested in and we would be able to verify that it, uh, it, uh, it does, in fact, uh, like that the, the two characters with the same phonetic rhyme in the shirching. But because the shirching is so small, we actually only have sort of indicative evidence of the type I've already shown you. And instead, it becomes a kind of matter of faith. We just, we believe in the Sheshang hypothesis. This Sheshang hypothesis in the form of, uh, that uh, Duan Yutai has said it, you know, is something that uh, is, is really one of the basic tools of uh, doing research in Chinese historical phonology. The other component uh, that we recognize, this fact that, that this series uh, has uh, all of the initials are, to use a technical term, homo-organic. Uh, it means that they, that, they, that they are articulated, the initials are articulated in the same place of articulation. Uh, but with different manners of articulation. That's what it means to be homo-organic. So they're all bilabial stops. Uh, that observation was kind of brought into the Sheisheng hypothesis by uh, explicitly by Li Feng Kui, saying that, yeah, you know, this is just, it's just changing the observation into a kind of a doctrine, if you like, right? So uh, any two characters that, say, that share the same phonetic component should have homo-organic initials. That's the, uh, these are the two components of the so-called Sheshang hypothesis. So if two characters have the same phonetic, that means they have the same rhyme, and that means they have homo-organic initials. So in a sense, it means that each uh, series, each phonetic should correspond with one syllable type in Old Chinese. Yeah, so they can have different manners of articulation and they can have different tones, but they should have the same rhyme and the same uh, place uh, of our articulation for the initial. So um, now that uh, that we have this uh, these these two components of the Sheshang hypothesis as like parts of our research program, uh, we want to look at places where they appear to be violated and see whether we can uh, we can fix them. Sheisheng series that mix Middle Chinese pronunciations 
with non-homoorganic initials provide an opportunity to explain the divergent Middle Chinese pronunciations as phonetically conditioned developments of Old Chinese readings that were homoorganic. Now we've changed you know, these observations about what it seems like the phonetics are encoding into a kind of uh, doctrine of what we presume they're encoding. And then we use that to actually do reconstruction. So uh, I will talk you through some examples. But first, I just have to introduce something that I'm not going to actually talk about, which is called the AB distinction. And uh, actually, we've already sort of met the AB distinction uh, in this series uh, here, yeah, where, um, you know, I'll just tell you the, the characters with the reading in Middle Chinese ah, those are so called type A syllables. And the characters with the reading ye are so called type B syllables. So, as we've already proven in this case, they these had the same rhyme in Old Chinese, and then it split in Middle Chinese. And so the conditioning factor for the split is the so-called A-B distinction. I'm not going to talk at all about what this might have been phonetically. It's extremely controversial. But it's clear, even from the, this evidence that I, I've shown here, that there was some conditioning environment for this split uh, in Old Chinese. And we call that... Uh, you know, the, the two settings of that conditioning environment, type A and type B. And it comes from the, 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 the actually from the, let's say, our awareness of it as a distinction and our way of talking about it comes from the uh, Song Dynasty rhyme tables, where, where, and this is just for those people who, who have some background in this sort of thing, uh, where the, uh, the type B syllables are the third division, the, the Sun Dung, uh, and all of the other divisions are uh, type A. But if you're not, if you don't know about divisions in the Song Dynasty rhyme tables, then you can ignore what I just said, uh, because it doesn't matter for this presentation. And instead, uh, this slide is just there to point out uh, that uh, the AB distinction is itself written into the structure of uh, Chinese characters for at least uh, some of the longer phonetic series. So uh, so in this series, which is actually uh, in Karlgren's numbering of, of phonetic series, it's series one. Uh, it's not in other people's. Uh, uh, but the, the kind of mother character of all of them you know, is on the left. Uh, and then it has certain characters that sort of, that, that use it directly as a phonetic. But then on the right, there's one of its daughter characters that itself is used as a phonetic for a bunch of other characters. And then these are, let's say, the, 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 the characters, which are nodes in this graph, to use kind of the technical terminology, uh, have been colored according to whether they're Middle Chinese initials. Uh, sorry, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it could be, uh, let's say, rhymes is, be is better. But let's say whether their Middle Chinese rhymes are type A or type B. And the ones on the left, uh, you see, are type A syllables. And the ones on the right are type B syllables. And you can see that these, these are written using Baxter's uh, transcription of Middle Chinese, which are a little bit different than mine. Uh, but you see all these Js. Yeah, those are Y, which I'm writing with an I. And that means there's something palatal going on in those syllables. So all of the syllables on the right are type B because they have this J in them, which in my system would be an I. And it, you see all the readings on the left. There's no, there's no I, there's no J. Yeah. So just to, you know, uh, reiterate to, to sum up, um, at least with this phonetic series, and there's, there's a, a few dozen uh, such phonetic series, the phonetic series itself breaks into kind of two uh, components. Uh, 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 the, the main series and the sub-series, if you like. And the sub-series is specifying type B, which means that whatever this AB distinction was, the people who first invented these characters uh, were aware of it and were using it in their decisions about uh, making Chinese characters. So now I've introduced the type A dis B distinction and proven that it's existed for a long time. That's the whole point, because it's going to come up uh, for the rest of my presentation. So um, now, 
we're looking at uh, just uh, a phonetic series uh, where the initials are not homoorganic. So ch is a palatal in the first one, and then p is a retroflex in the second one, and d is a retroflex, and then we have two dentals. So this series using these middle Chinese readings violates the Shesheng hypothesis. So now we want to fix it somehow, right? So uh, the first proposal we'll, we'll throw out there is that all Chinese T changed to Ch in type B syllables. And then the second proposal that we'll make is that all Chinese Tra changed to Ch. Uh, and this happened both in type B and in type A syllables, so we don't need to specify. And similarly, that Dra changed into Da. So, um, uh, so those are the proposals we're going to make. And then I'll also mention that these same proposals can be motivated on grounds that have nothing to do with phonetics, uh, like phonetic uh, components of characters, but entirely based on uh, distributional patterns in, inside uh, Middle Chinese using internal reconstruction. But I, that's just a sort of side note to say uh, we have independent motivation for these three proposals. So now, if we did I did I write them? No, I didn't. Uh, but anyhow, now you can imagine the first one started with a T, the second one with a T, the third one with a D. So now they're all home organic in Old Chinese. If we if we believe these uh, proposals, right? Okay. So now we look at this series, and here we have other Ds. So uh, yeah, so the third uh, one is D. Uh, the second one is D. So no problem, right? Because we've already found a way of changing retroflex initials into dentals. But what about this ya at the beginning? It's a problem, yeah? So this is what I just said, that uh, the da can be taken back to dra, but that only gets us so far in making this uh, series conform to the Shesheng hypothesis. So the question is, what sound do we know of yeah, in linguistics in general, maybe, that can become both a ya and a da? And the answer is L. Yeah? And um, uh, I, 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 what I should do now is give you lots of examples, uh, but I haven't sort of uh, done the homework to do that. Uh, but I will just point out that, uh, um, that in, in uh, Spanish, uh, ya, uh, like in me llamo, uh, comes from L. Yeah, it's still spelled L. Uh, and then in Latin, it actually comes from a cluster. So in, in this particular word, clamare is what uh, is where yamar comes from. Uh, and then um, L can be fortified uh, into, um, into D. That happened uh, in, uh, in, I think, in Latin as well. But I don't know the details. And it definitely happens in Tibetan. Yeah. So, uh, so we have good reason. Just if we pose the question, what could become a ya sometimes and a da in other time, other uh, circumstances, an l makes sense. So let's uh, go with that. Uh, and this was uh, originally proposed by Edwin Pulleyblank. I'm I'm slightly simplifying. He, he didn't quite propose it in the in the modern form, yeah, or in the form we currently use. Uh, and then Baxter and Cigar have taken over that proposal from him in exactly the way I'm formulating here. So uh, L in type B syllables becomes ya, uh, and L in type A syllables becomes da, and L followed by an R, uh, whether in type A or in type B, uh, becomes da. Now, I'll just mention that this is Baxter and Cigar's notation, and, and I probably should have uh, not included it because it's probably confusing, but this little pharyngealization symbol means type A. So... Um, so they, they their sort of very te very tentative proposal is that maybe type A syllables were pharyngealized and type B syllables weren't pharyngealized, uh, but but you can just see it as a kind of almost arbitrary index that says uh, that if that little pharyngealization symbol is there, that means it's type A. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so here we've done it. We've fixed this series, right? So uh, it all three started with L. Yeah. So now moving on, here uh, we have the problem that uh, the series has one 
reading with a velar nasal initial, na, nen, and, and one with a with a with a ha. It's actually it's like like a Chinese ha. The ha. It's a, a, vel, a voiceless velar fricative. So han. So how do we um, change? Uh, I mean, this is what we're going to do. You, you you could maybe say the reverse, but how are we going to change this ha by going backwards in time into some kind of uh, nasal? Yeah. Uh, and then similarly, we have series like this one. Uh, and this one's clear because the majority reading is uh, is nasal. We have velar nasal, nga and nge. And then we have this other character whose reading is hye. So, so probably the hye comes from some kind of velar nasal, right? So this is the, the proposal that the he readings come from voiceless nasals. So old Chinese had something like hna, uh, and the hna became he, uh, whereas the nga stayed nga. Yeah. And that way, it's just like the, the, the variation we see between P and B, right? It's like we have we have uh, voiceless labials and voice labials in the same series. Here we have uh, voiceless velar nasals and voice velar nasals in the same series. And then in this series, similarly, we have nga, uh, we have uh, nga, and then we have uh, ha. So uh, I've given you one uh, type A example and one a type B example of a, a, vo a voiceless velar nasal changing into a ha. Okay, now we'll just go through and I'll maybe speed up a little bit uh, so you don't get bored. The other places of articulation with the nasals. So uh, in this series, uh, the first one at the top, we have two readings, heck and m and, and or huck and muck. Uh, so the proposal is that the huck comes from muck. Uh, and then uh, that's in type A uh, syllables. And then in type B syllables, here we have two readings uh, or two characters, one with the reading shuet and, and one with the reading miet. So we think that the first one, probably the H, you know, came from uh, from a voiceless M. Hma. Yeah. All right. And then same thing for the dental nasals. So uh, we have this series with the readings tan, nan, and nen. So where does this tan come from? So, so far... The poorly behaved readings in nasal series started with an H. Now I have a poorly behaved reading that starts with a TH. But in case, T and, uh, well, T and N actually uh, have the same uh, place of articulation, but uh, uh, we, we, we like nasals to have their own series. Let's put it that way. Uh, so in this case, we think that TAN came from HNA, HNAN, yeah? Uh, and then looking at uh, type B syllables, so we have, uh, these three characters that in Middle Chinese are nye, nye, and xie. So now the odd man out is the xie reading. So why not use the same proposal? We say xie comes from nye. And now you also see, uh, let's say, methodologically, the nice, the convenient thing about the A versus B distinction is I can propose two different sound changes, right? I can propose it Na changes into ta, and I can also propose that na changes into sha, because one happens only in type A syllables, and one only only happens in type B syllables. So there's no there's no contradiction to the exceptionalness of the proposals, because the A B distinction is a conditioning environment. And then last but not least, uh, this ha, uh, we can reconstruct back to na, uh, and that occurs uh, in type B syllables. Whereas, you know, we might have expected it to be a sha based on uh, the middle examples. All right. So now we've dealt with, uh, so, so just, you know, to review, we, we, we started with uh, dentals and just showed that we can, this is the kind of simplest case, we can fix a series like this. So first we fixed this kind of relatively simple series. Then we fixed this more complicated series. Uh, and and thereby proposed a new kind of uh, consonant in Old Chinese, laterals. Then we proposed voiceless uh, nasals in order to deal with these examples. And now we're going to propose other voiceless resonance because kind of once we've let the cat out of the bag and we're letting ourselves have voiceless resonance, maybe we can have other types of voiceless resonance. So here is uh, some evidence for um, voiceless laterals. 
So we've already shown that a series that mixes D and L, sorry, a D and Y, yeah, uh, we will reconstruct back to an L, yeah. But now we see two other readings in this character in, in this series. So if you only had the first two, you would say, okay, fine, this is L. This is very straightforward L series. But then we have this shoe reading and this two reading. Uh, what to do about those? So once again, we just say, well, how about a voiceless lateral? A voiceless lateral that in type B syllables becomes sh, and in type uh, A syllables becomes ta, which is the same behavior that we got with the, the voiceless nasal, the voiceless dental nasal, right? Uh, so that seems like a reasonable proposal. And then we can also uh, find cases where we want to do this with R. Now, I actually haven't discussed, but Middle Chinese L comes from R. We have reasons to to do that, and and partly, uh, you know, we want the L for other things, right? For for <laughs> for explaining the mixed D uh, Y series. Okay, so uh, so uh, a series where you have le le and te, it looks, you know, it looks like we're doing a sort of le thing here, uh, but then this te gets in the way. Uh, but then we propose that shra uh, in type A syllables becomes ta. And then uh, in type B syllables, we propose that sh becomes te, te, yeah. So that's interesting. This is a, it, it sort of breaks the symmetry a little bit. Um, but anyhow, there you go. So here are our voiceless resonants, and then just a little bit of uh, you know intellectual history. The first voiceless resonant that was proposed was the voiceless nasal, which was proposed by Dong Tong He. Uh, and then uh, you know. Uh, some people liked his idea. Uh, so then Polyblank extended it to the velar uh, nasals, the labiovelar nasals, and the dental nasals, as well as the voiceless lateral. Uh, and then Baxter added the voiceless rhotic. So, so um, yeah, I've sort of mostly presented them in, in the order that they were proposed, although I started with, uh, uh, I think, with the velar nasal, and I, maybe I should have started with the uh, labial nasal, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so, ba so Baxter proposed the last one in 1992. And then my reconstructions, I've been following the system of Baxter and Cigar from 2014. So they've accepted these uh, proposals. Okay. And then here's just a summary chart of the uh, voiceless uh, resonance. Uh, so you have ma changing into ha, and then you have na, la, and shra changing into ta in type A syllables. And then you have Ma and ma changing into ha in type B, same as in type A, no difference in, in between them. And then in type B, you get na and la changing into sha, but you get sha changing into ra. ra. Right. So I think, uh, let's say, how long have I been going? About half an hour, yeah. Um, well, no, okay, well, I have lots of time. So then I'll also show you the uvulars. But I'll say that, you know, if you found, if, if if this has started to get boring, then, you know, you can come back in five minutes or something like that. Because uh, it's kind of more of the same. Yeah. But uh, the, 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 the problem is, is the same. The motivation is the same. Fixing poorly behaved phonetic series. Yeah. Okay. So some series mix velars and... Uh, with, with a glottal stop. So this first row is velars, right? K is a, a velar, a, a voiceless velar stop. G is a voiced velar stop. Uh, this H with the line under it is a voiced velar uh, fricative. And then the normal H is a voiceless velar fricative. Yeah. Uh, and then we have this glottal stop. These are all middle Chinese initials. Uh, and then we have the ya initial also in middle Chinese. Yeah. So, so ya is a palatal. Uh, the glottal stop is a glottal. So they're not velars. That's the point. So uh, if we have a series like this, you see that it mixes uh, velars and glottals. It has three velars, two fricatives, one stop, uh, and then a glottal. So this is violating the Sheishan hypothesis. So what, how, what to do? How can we uh, deal with this? So how about we propose that the glottal comes from a voiceless uh, uvular stop, and that the uh, that the H, so the velar fricative, comes from a voiceless aspirate uh, uvular stop. So I will try to make these, but I'm no phonetician. Uh, the Q is like in 
Qatar, the country in the Middle East, yeah. And then uh, the QH, you just put a little bit of air after that. Qatar, Qatar, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the proposal we're going to make. And uh, we see that, uh, you know, I don't know, this is what it looks like if we add that proposal. We haven't quite gotten there because uh, we haven't dealt with the fourth one yet, uh, or the first one for that matter, yeah. Um, but we can add this proposal just sort of for, basically for purposes of symmetry, right? That the, that the, if, if the, if the uh, voiceless velar fricative comes from a uvular, maybe the voice velar fricative also comes from a uvular, uh, and that's a voiced uvular, which is a la, yeah? So I'm not going to get into Baxter and Cigar's explanation for the velars uh, that pop up in uvular series. It has to do with consonant clusters. And I just wanted to keep this simple with the uh, simple initials. But basically, uh, you can imagine that uh, when uvulars occur in certain kinds of clusters, they change into velars. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, you know, typologically, I, here, you know, you would have to look at uh, uh, Bong Mian or, or Arabic or something like that. Uh, but uh, for, for uvulars to turn, change sometimes into glottals and sometimes into velars is perfectly normal, right? It's basically, they're at a certain, uh, you know, they're, they're quite far back in the, in the throat, uvulars. And then if they move a little forward, they become velars. And if they move a little further back, they become uh, glottals, yeah? Uh, and then we also have series that mix ya with uh, velars like this one. And here, you know, it's, we, it's, it's a sort of fourth problem if you like, but we can use the same solution by proposing uh, the voiced velar, sorry, the vo voiced uvular stop uh, G. But what's the difference? Well, here the G is in a type A syllable and here the G is in the type B syllable. So again, the, the, the A, B distinction is, is helping us to, uh, to do work for us without adding uh, a whole lot uh, in terms of uh, machinery, yeah? Uh, and then this is just a little detail, uh, but uh, before front vowels, uh, Baxter and Cigar think that uh, GW, so, so, so a, a, a voiced labio uvular becomes ya, and they point to this series as evidence. So you see there's an N, E, uh, front vowel. Uh, and then otherwise, it becomes a, uh, a velar fricative in, 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 uh, in type B. Uh, so, so this is another way to get, you know, they, they've noticed that you can get the two different outcomes with a condition change. So you don't have to propose, you know, five, six different uh, sources, yeah? Um, so, uh, I, I, I'll, I think skip over this one. Yeah. And just, uh, say that, uh, now in terms of the intellectual history, this, this uvular hypothesis was proposed first by, uh, Pan Wu Yun, uh, but then Baxter and Cigar have slightly altered his, his, uh, proposals and I won't go into those details. Yeah. Uh, and then just to point out that there is some comparative evidence that suggests that this is onto the right track. Uh, basically, foreign words in early Chinese. These are military titles. Uh, so the first one is uh, a Shongnu uh, military title. Uh, and uh, Alexander Vovin uh, thinks that it uh, is borrowed from proto yenisean where, you know, say for totally independent reasons, uh, people working on proto yenisean have, have, have uh, suggested uh, uvulars. Now it doesn't work perfectly, right? Like, um, why is it that the the first syllable uh, I I is rounded in Old Chinese but not in uh, Proto Yenisean and whatnot? So I, you, you know, you, you know, I'm not uh, not a whole lot hangs on whether you're convinced by this, but it's kind of uh, anecdotal evidence uh, that uh, this uvular hypothesis is onto something. And then similarly. Uh, there's a, a Turkic, uh, an old Turkic uh, word, which is an, also a military title, Tarkan, uh, with a with a, a, a uvular stop, uh, that uh, was borrowed into Chinese as you see it. Uh, so maybe this is evidence that uh, the uvular hypothesis is onto something. Okay, so now just summing up the uh, the uvular 
um, proposal. So in type A syllables, you get what you see. Yeah. So so this becomes a glottal, and then this becomes these. The, uh, uh, oh, I've this one should have a line under it. Sorry about that. Um, and so should this one. So um, those are those are the proposals for uh, type A syllables, and here are the proposals for type B syllables. And this is that uh, conditioned uh, change I was talking about. So you get a split where the 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 voiced labio uvular stop uh, becomes a, a velar fricative in general, but before front vowels it becomes a paddle, and that's like there's nothing more normal in life than something paddleizing before front vowels, right? Uh, so that makes sense. Okay, so that's the whole proposal, or that's the whole presentation, basically, where where um, you know, let's go back uh, to 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 early on. Basically, our understanding that we got to here is where is the understanding that we end with, which is what does a uh, the phonetic in a Chinese character tell the reader about the pronunciation of that Chinese character at the moment it was coined? It tells them uh, that or tells them what its place of articulation is for the initial. In this case, uh, bilabial. It's saying this syllable starts with bilabial. And it tells you its rhyme. Uh, in this case, ah is the rhyme. So, so this phonetic says things like pa, where things like pa can mean pa or ba or pa. Yeah? And uh, in order to believe this, uh, we have had to add a lot more uh, things to Old Chinese. Uh, so, so laterals and uh, voiceless resonance and uh, uvulars. But, uh, you know, that's, or I don't know whether you want to believe it or not, not, ever, not everyone does. But basically the upshot is you can specify for each phonetic what syllable type is implied by that phonetic. So this is where I jump to the end, and I am uh, working on finding a way of romanizing Chinese characters uh, that reveals this. So, so I'm not sure I've been very clear about that. But in this case, we have, this is the, the, the Sheisheng series, the phonetic series of all characters that have this as their phonetic, yeah? And then what this means is a syllable like lay, right? So it's it's a, a syllable that starts with a lateral and has i as its uh, rhyme. And then the first, the, the middle Chinese reading of this character, like not, not this as a phonetic, we have to distinguish it as a phonetic and it as its own character. So the reading of it, it as its own character in middle Chinese is ta, yeah? Um, but, uh, we, you know, we, we know it's a, it's a lateral because of these yas down here, basically, right? Because we know that, 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 that in a series that mixes, uh, dentals and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and yeah, uh, we reconstruct a lateral. I sort of went through that, right? But now I'm just trying to show you this sort of thing I've been doing that probably looks totally perverse, uh, where... So, so it's a kind of little dictionary, if you like, where I give the phonetic, then I give the syllable type, lay, and then the, the reading of that character in Middle Chinese. Uh, and then here's the next, this is the, the, the next character. So this character uh, has two dimensions. And then I write the uh, semantic as a, a superscript. And then the phonetic uh, in Roman, uh, so what this is, is this is telling you, okay, this morpheme has something to do with infirmity, with sickness, and is pronounced something like lay, yeah? Uh, and then you, you, in order to know, you know, it's middle Chinese pronunciation, you just have to look it up, right? Uh, but these are its two middle uh, Chinese pronunciations. Now, together, those two pieces of information allow you to reconstruct it in old Chinese, but I'm not doing that here, right? I'm giving you the pieces so that you can do it. So in particular, 
uh, you need to reconstruct a, uh, a, a voiceless lateral in order to get uh, these readings, yeah? But the fact that this morpheme had a voiceless lateral in Old Chinese is in no way indicated by uh, the Chinese character. The thing that's indicated by the Chinese character is that it starts with some kind of lateral. So anyhow, this is my uh, you know, attempt to sort of make explicit uh, the the phonetic information that's actually contained inside the Chinese character. Uh, and I've also sort of indicated to you how uh, we go about figuring that out. Yeah. Uh, so basically, you assemble all the middle Chinese readings of all of the characters in that phonetic. Then you use this sort of Sheisheng hypothesis, you use the Sheisheng hypothesis as a principle uh, to decide what it is that the common denominator of all those characters are, then you can write that down. And then in this case, it means uh, they, all of these characters uh, start with some kind of lateral, and then they have I as their rhyme. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know, you know, um, what the upshot is pedagogically, but like, I, I think that it's, it's maybe, you know, it's, it's important for students to know maybe that, uh, the, the principle that you see at work uh, in, in the example horse and mother is in fact at work in, in effectively all Chinese characters. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that it doesn't work in Putonghua is, you know, so much the loss for Putonghua. Yeah. Um, and that, it, you know, maybe some kind of transcription like this uh, could be a useful way to memorize Chinese characters. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, it might just be, you know, a waste of time because it would be telling you how they were pronounced in the Zhou dynasty. Um, but that information, is that's another point that I would say, that information about how they were pronounced in the Zhou dynasty is like every time you type a character in a modern font on your computer, you're putting that information in there, right? It's there in the character. Okay, so that's where I will I will just, you know, go to the last slide where I thank you and then I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, and that's my presentation. Thank you yeah. so much.